So thanks everyone for, com for coming to our uh, third IEP Origin of Life lecture um, this month. Uh, so today uh, we have Anna Wayne uh, coming to us from uh, MGH, where uh, she is a uh, NASA postdoctoral fellow um, who is in Jack Shockstack's lab and studying um, the abiotic origins and properties of, of membrane systems. So in the uh, previous two lectures uh, we've had during IAP, we, we, we've heard uh, from speakers who have studied the origin of uh, replication of nucleic acids, of, of proteins um, that do catalysis, all these other parts, what we think are essential parts of, of cellular systems. But another important part that often gets overlooked is uh, the membrane itself, the, 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 the boundedness of a cell in that very complex system that regulates and mediates what, what is self from non-self. And, and clearly that it's also had to evolve and um, the, the origins of that system are just as important to understand as the origins of anything that is inside of a cell that that's more traditionally considered. Um, and uh, so if Anna's ready, we'll, we'll just start. Okay, thanks Greg. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, it's been really fun being a postdoc in Jack's lab. So. As Greg mentioned, I work on the membrane aspect of uh, you know, what could have existed in the earliest sort of pre-cellular life forms on Earth, or oh, not life forms, pre-cellular forms on Earth. Um, the rest of the lab actually works very much on RNA, how that molecule could uh, replicate, grow and divide. Um, and so I'm gonna try and give a bit of a flavor to what the lab overall works on um, before jumping into what I actually spend my time doing. Okay. <clears throat> so, I joined uh, this lab about a year ago and my background is in applied physics, thinking a lot about like light scattering and like 3D imaging, things like that. And so uh, I have to sort of bring myself back to first principles when I start thinking about such a big problem like the origins of life. And I think the first question that lots of my um, friends from grad school like to ask me is like, what is life? And try to get me to define it. And I think it's a uh, I always tell them this, and like you know, I don't, I don't want to go there. Um, I think there are lots of very smart people thinking about it. I think about it sometimes, but um, I think it's a prob it, It's like a question that people can work on and work around without like explicitly defining what life is. And there are some people who even who even argue that you don't need an explicit definition to you know think of tractable problems to work on. Okay, so I'm going to cross that out. And then um, I was the, my friends also asked me like, what do you mean by the origin of life if you can't even define life. And again, it's like, okay, maybe we don't even need to sort of explicitly define each of those words to do some valuable science here. And so um, this, the sort of tiny piece of the puzzle that uh, in Jack's lab we're trying to work on is, you know, what is a really minimal system that's capable of replication, growth and division, you know, some of the ingredients that might sort of make you think, ooh, life. Um, and uh, that could conceivably lead to a more complex form of life. So they're really clever computer scientists, I guess, who've written, you know, if you, if you try to define life, there's a computer scientist out there, they'll write an algorithm that can like tick all those boxes, right? And so that's why we have tacked on the caveat, like, you know, what is a system we can make in lab that could conceivably lead to more complex forms of life as we know it? Okay, so we would call such a system a protocell because it's not a cell, um, but it has some of the essence of one. And like I said, we're working on a very small piece of the puzzle here. Like if everyone wants to try to understand uh, the question of how did life on Earth originate, um, you know, we need to attack it from all angles. So there are people doing the top-down approach, like looking at what life exists on Earth now and working backwards in time to seeing what simpler or what, what sort of ancient, uh, you know, processes uh, still exist today and what that can tell us about history. Um, so the, the approach that I mentioned, trying to make this sort of minimal artificial cell in lab, that's what we call the bottom-up approach. So we're trying to start with simple building blocks and seeing how far we could get and run it forwards in time. Can we evolve this thing to something more complex that resembles a unicellular organism? And then there are, of course, lots of other people working on other systems like with clays, um, understanding m metabolic cycles and how that can like complexify. Um, and then also looking at alternative polymers and you know the fossil record. There, there are so many pieces of this puzzle and um, in fact, two weeks ago, there was a Gordon conference on the origins of life and all these people come together, not all of them. Just a small part of the community comes together, but it's still like everyone from all sorts of backgrounds. And, uh, you know, there's something to learn from everyone. So I'm, I'm just talking about one 
piece of the puzzle here. And then even at that Origins of Life conference, we're missing conversation from the astrophysicists because uh, there are people thinking about alternative chemistries and how life, like, uh, not based on the chemistries we know of on Earth could, could exist elsewhere in the universe. And that's also, there's also a lot to learn from that community. And so that's the field that we call astrobiology. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have enough time here to go into everything. So unfortunately, we're going to ignore this cool stuff today. I think you're going to hear more about that on Friday. And we're just going to be focusing on the life uh, that we see on Earth. So life as we know it. It's a cool planet. Um, OK, so then the, the question we're trying to well, that I'll try to like introduce you to during this talk is uh, what are the ingredients for a protocell? So this is, you know, a minimal artificial cell system that we can build in the lab, hopefully under prebiotically uh, plausible conditions. So like, you know, not using microfluidics or something, but just getting things to self-assemble and not using any enzymes, but just getting reactions to go by themselves. Um, you know, when, if we can build such a system, can we get it to evolve to something more complex? And then the, the one ingredient, I'd say, the first ingredient to making a protocell is thinking of an information-carrying substance that can be propagated. So something that you can call it, you know, um, the, the start of heredity. And I was reading a lecture by Schrodinger in, at the end of World War II, and he gave this sort of very interesting, many-page-long uh, discussion of you know where what people thought a gene was back in those days before they could um, I mean b before the the magic of the x-ray of the x-rays told them what it was um, and they knew it was very very small so he was sort of kind of just saying like we, we know how very small things behave if you have a pollen grain in water it jiggles around it's subject to random thermal motion Brownian motion and whatever makes up a gene is even smaller than that. So imagine the chaos it must be in if it's jiggling around all the time. How can you possibly pass down information in such an accurate, precise way? And the conclusion that he arrived to was that these tiny, tiny things that were passing down the information must have been connected to each other, like holding hands. And so he, from those kind of basic principles, just argued uh, that you know to have heredity in a small, compact uh, molecule, that molecule must be must be long, essentially, must be a polymer. So I thought that was super cool that he kind of figured out, I mean, he, didn't, he basically figured out what it was without uh, knowing much at all. Um, and, you know, we, we know much more about genetic polymers since then, but for now I'm just going to say, like, the first ingredient to making a protocell is a polymer. Okay. And then, um, I guess given the title of my talk, I might be a bit biased, but I'd say the second essential ingredient to a protocell is actually having a compartment. And so I, I didn't come up with this idea at all. There are lots of very clever people who figured out why you need a compartment. So I'll go through some of the arguments. So um, firstly, there's this sort of philosophical idea. If you just have a polymer floating around, does, is anyone really comfortable calling that life? I think most people probably not. And so the idea of a compartment is it creates uh, an identity. It delineates like inside from outside, and you're creating a sense of sort of one entity. Okay. The next point is a little bit more sophisticated, and actually um, the first place I read about it was in a review paper by Jack um, and two others um, more, than, more than 10 years ago. And the argument is that if you have a polymer um, that is able to replicate itself and pass on its information, um, and this polymer is near other polymers that don't quite resemble it, then it's wasting its efforts by copying these unrelated polymers next door. So I've, I've got a little cartoon here. So the, say the blue one is able to replicate um, polymers. So the blue polymer is a self-replicase. Um, if it's near lots of red polymers, then it's going to waste all of its fitness and energy replicating those red ones, and it's not going to boost its own population. However, if you separate the blue ones from the red ones or keep you know, closely related polymers uh, with, their, uh, with each other in families, um, in compartments, then if one of them is able to evolve this self-replicating behavior, then it's able to conserve that fitness um, and pass on that fitness to its offspring. Okay. And so, uh, you know, the easiest way to separate things is to have them into com in compartments. And then if you have polymers that are able to, like, copy polymers that resemble themselves and um, propagate that information, then you have a pool in, on which you can apply selective pressures and start evolution. Um, yeah, so a compartment is, I'd say, pretty essential, a pretty essential second ingredient. 
Okay. Once you have a compartment, you can do all sorts of things. So if you have a gene genetic polymer that's encapsulated um, inside uh, a packet, whatever that is, um, this thing can probably move around and it's still protected from the environment, so it suddenly has mobility. Um, it might also have a way to keep things out. Um, so if there are toxins in the environment that it doesn't want to take in, it now has a way to not let them near the polymer. Um, you can also create chemical gradients and that can be harnessed to do work. And then you can also imagine that different compartments have different reactions going on. You can then combine them, get more complex behavior. And you can also uh, prevent dilution of all the things inside um, by having a compartment. So um, yeah, so now we have arrived at like the two main sort of ingredients for a protocell, and that is a genetic polymer and a compartment to put it inside. And that essentially is what we're trying to build in Jack's lab at MGH. So it seems simple, but I'll show you why it isn't. Okay. So first of all, you have to choose the information carrying polymer. So um, again, there are lots of people working on all different aspects of this problem. I'm just presenting one viewpoint. Um, but there's a very uh, sort of well-conserved system of information propagation um, in life on Earth as we know it. And what happens is that most life just has DNA as a genetic blueprint. Um, you need proteins in order to sort of catalyze reactions. You need proteins for metabolism and for structural reasons. But in order to make proteins, uh, the body first sort of copies the, the bit of information it needs from the DNA into RNA, and then it uses that RNA to make the protein. Um, and when people discovered that RNA could also catalyze reactions, that was the moment when people thought, oh my goodness, this molecule is uh, it's, it's everything. <laughs> um, not only is it a catalyst, it also carries information. And um, so I'll just show you what RNA is here. And so it's this sort of molecule that resembles DNA. Um, there's a backbone, so the di it's going diagonally from top left to bottom right. And the backbone is what we'd call like the, the pentagons, which are the sugars, and the phosphate groups to the left of those. Um, and to the right of those are the information carrying bits. These are the, these are the nitrogenous bases. And like DNA, there are four bases, A, C, uh, G and in the case of RNA, U. And all you need to know, so there's a background, there's, there are these four bases, and RNA, like DNA, is able to capture information in this very sort of uh, secure way because um, each of these bases can hydrogen bond with another base, and then we call them ba that they're base pairing. So they, this information can be transmitted sort of across um, into another polymer by base pairing. And essentially, you have the same information on both sides, just the complement. Okay, so A always pairs with U, C always pairs with G. And so if you have one of these polymers, you can make another one quite easily, just by that base pairing interaction. Um, the way this is done in the body is that you start off with individual segments. So I've drawn a dotted line where, um, where we would call like the, the monomer is. Um, so each of those four units we call a monomer, and when we join them together, that's the polymer. Um, and so in the body, it's very complicated to do this. We need enzymes to do it. So the question uh, that we ask is if RNA is catalytic, can be catalytically active and it can also carry information, we of course want to use it in a, um, in a protocell. But how are we going to get it to make itself without any enzymes? And so that's a question that um, Leslie Orgel, uh, amongst others, uh, started tackling decades ago and um, people in Jack's lab and other labs um, work on now. And what people found is that if you have one of these um, nucleotides, so that's like uh, one of these monomers I sh I'm showing you here, um, if you have a very reactive group on the left um, that wants to leave, then it can basically uh, join up with another one and polymerize. And so there's a lot of like very sophisticated chemistry to un in that goes into understanding what this leaving group may be, what the exact chemical mechanism is. Um, but all I want to show you uh, today is how we do this in lab. Okay, so I'm just going to like reduce this reactive monomer into, uh, into cartoon form. So I said earlier there's the information carrying part, which is the base. There's also sugar. I'm going to represent that in green. And then there's the very reactive red part that wants to leave. Um, it wants to react and leave. And so uh, using this system, people have been able to sort of get RNA to polymerize without any enzymes. Um, what happens is you get, uh, say you have, 
a template. So what I'm calling a template here is just a bit of RNA that has information that we want to copy. Um, you put a shorter bit on top, and we call that a primer. And then these reactive monomers will just, um, without the aid of any enzymes, uh, but for various reasons you need a divalent cation, such as magnesium in the system, um, these reactive monomers will um, attach to the template by base pairing and then react and polymerize and extend the primer. Um, the red bit will pop off. And what you end up getting um, is an uh, elongated second green strand. And you can separate, sorry, you can separate this green strand into two, um, add primers, add these reactive monomers, and then uh, so all of a sudden you have two copies of what you started off with. So none of this uh, uses enzymes in the lab, and all of the molecules that are made, everyone, of course, is trying to synthesize them under early Earth conditions. And it's uh, been shown that it's possible to do all this. And in fact, um, yeah, we can talk about it more later if you want. But it seems kind of surprising to me in the beginning why, would we, why we would choose uh, this sort of very reactive thing. But in fact, it's only very reactive in the presence of a template that it can, bond, uh, that it can bind to. So now we have this uh, genetic polymer, RNA, that's able to um, basically you put it in a beaker with some reactive monomer and it's able to copy itself. Okay, um, this is the cartoon here. Um, it's, of course, uh, getting this to work once isn't the aim. We want it to work well and we want to be able to copy like longer and longer pieces of RNA so we can propagate more and more complex bits of information that you might be able to um, start applying selective pressures to. So with longer pieces of RNA, they can fold up upon themselves, create interesting secondary structures, and maybe even start catalyzing reactions. And so the ultimate goal, at least of the RNA copying part in lab, is to um, duplicate or like replicate longer and longer pieces of RNA. And to, in order to do that, um, you basically need a lot of very, very clever synthetic and organic chemists. Um, it's, pretty complicated, and again, everyone's trying to work under the constraints of uh, prebiotic conditions, so it's not an easy problem. Okay. So then the second ingredient in our protocell is the membrane, or not the membrane, sorry, it's the compartment. I got ahead of myself. Um, so there are many ways to choose how to uh, stick an information polymer into a compartment to protect it. There are many, many ways, and um, I'll just go through uh, these, and you can Google these words and read a whole host of really interesting papers um, from people who are like atmospheric chemists and geologists just from all sorts of fields. Um, yeah, so the first one is the idea of using liquid-liquid phase separation in order to sequester um, RNA molecules and to protect them from the external environment. So apparently if you just mix together polymers of opposite charge, um, you can get them to condense into droplets inside, uh, inside water. If you look at them under microscope, they just look like oil droplets, so they're quite fluid. Um, the molecule's are able to rearrange, but it's a condensed phase. So these systems are called coacivates, and there are lots of people working on that. And in fact, in our cells, I think there are some coacivates in our cells as well, like pea granules or something. Um, if any biologists are here, like you can interject, but um, it's, it's not some weird like lab contrived thing, like there are coacivates in our cells. Anyone? No? Anyway, um, yeah, so this isn't like, yeah? It's just a simple question. So chemically speaking, what are hydrogels? Chemically speaking, what are hydrogels? Yeah. It's something like agarose. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like polymers that are with a very low weight percent to yeah. have enough interaction that they can hold like 99% water. Oh, sorry, 99 times their weight in water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Secret? Cool. Um, there are also some people who realize that you know, it's very easy to generate aerosols. So if you have an early earth ocean or big pond or something with some wind, with some tidal activity, you can uh, aerosolize um, droplets quite easily. And as these aerosols float around, some of them can be very long lived, up to weeks at a time, and then um, they can dry out. You can have reactions on the surface of aerosols. You can keep stuff safe on the inside. And so that's also a very rich environment in which to um, sort of create neat chemical reactions. Okay, uh, yeah, the next one is hydrogel. So like I said, um, if you have very long polymers, so like the glycoproteins presumably, like in, in your snot, um, you know, you don't need much material in order to trap a lot of water. So you can imagine trapping like, you know, RNA in there. 
getting reactions to happen. Um, that's one way to stop reactants from diffusing away from each other is to trap them in like a gel. Okay. Um, and then the last few examples uh, of how physically you can confine things. So there are geologists who realized um, there are many sort of porous rocks that could have been relevant maybe on early Earth, and inside those pores, you can also concentrate molecules, get reactions to happen. You can also get them to happen between the platelets of uh, minerals like clay, um, and also just on mineral surfaces. So these are all legitimate ways in which you can condense or compartmentalize um, reactants for any reaction you want. And there are very smart people working on all of these. Um, the, we, we kind of chose like the, I don't know, the, the I, I, I I want to say easiest path, but like, I don't know if that's true. But um, we wanted to basically think about membranes because all of the life we know on Earth has a membrane as the way to keep its insides in. Um, and so the thought is, if we rewind time a bit, a membrane had to have existed at some point, so it's a thing that's quite worth looking at. Okay, that's just some E. coli. So all the membranes um, that we know of on Earth right now uh, that sort of keep um, cellular organisms in, in their cellular form um, are comprised of phospholipids or something similar. So what these molecules are are like a sort of a hydrophilic or water-loving head group which is depicted in white in a circle and it's uh, connected covalently to two fatty chains and these fatty chains are basically just like oil by themselves. Um, but basically when you have a hydrophilic head group and hydrophilic tails, um, the hydrophilic tails in water do not want to be um, hydrated. So it's very hard to try and pack water, mo water molecules around these hydrophobic tails. Instead, the most energetically favorable uh, configuration is what I've shown here, which is that all of these fatty tails line up against each other. Um, Essentially, by doing that, they're freeing up a lot of water molecules to explore configurational space. So this is like entropically the favored, uh, the favored morphology for, um, these, uh, for these amphiphiles. And basically, just in terms of ter terminology, um, I've shown here that these uh, fatty tails have aggregated and they point to each other and they're actually in two layers. So this is called a bilayer. So one of these membranes um, is actually called a bilayer. And yeah, so I'll be talking about bilayers quite a bit in the next few slides, I guess. Um, yeah, so the problem with these membranes is if we think about rewinding time and how they would have existed um, on early Earth, if these membranes did exist, they're actually really, really good barriers. So life, as we know it, has evolved to have lots of um, membrane proteins that selectively let things in and selectively, uh, you know, let things out. Um, both by active and passive transport. And these membranes without any membrane proteins are actually incredibly um, not leaky. So if you imagine the situation where this like poor little RNA polymer needs an extra monomer to grow longer, it's not gonna be able to import any monomers in or any charged species uh, of any sort. Um, these membranes are just really, really well sealed. And so the thing we want uh, for a model protocell system is actually a bit of a leaky membrane. If we want um, this sort of minimal cell system where you have genetic polymer on the inside um, that's able to sort of take up nutrients from the outside, then you want a membrane that's much leakier than a phospholipid membrane. Okay. Luckily for us, if you chop off one of the fatty tails off of a phospholipid, um, which is basically just soap, um, these things also form membranes in water. So uh, when I talked about these fatty tails, um, the specific sort of fat I'm talking about is a fatty acid. So like I said, this is basically soap. Um, what it is, it's an alkane, or not, but anyway, it's a, it's a series of carbons and hydrogens. And at the very end, there's a carboxylic acid group. And it's that carboxylic acid group that um, fulfills the uh, sort of hydrophilic or water-loving role that you need in order to make, um, make it an amphiphile, amphiphilic molecule. Okay, and it was very exciting when people realized that you could just use fatty acids to make membranes because these things are found on meteorites. Um, there also is a very clear path to synthesize them um, in a prebiotically plausible way with very simple starting chemicals. And um, these membranes are actually quite leaky. So if you start off with a membrane that is comp 
comprised of fatty acids rather than phospholipids. Um, if there are any nutrients on the outside, such as RNA monomers, they're able to you know, cross the membrane. You can imagine a system where there's RNA polymerizing on the inside of a membrane. If a monomer comes in, it's going to join that polymer, and then the large polymer won't be able to leave again. Secret. Which fatty acids does the synthesis make? Um, it makes saturated um, short chain ones. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a bit of a closer view of these fatty acids, and I've just shown one particular one here. It's called oleic acid. It's what's in 70% of olive oil. So basically, if you throw sodium hydroxide onto olive oil, you can rip off free fatty acids that look like this. Um, yeah, so what happens here is that uh, I've got a little cartoon that kind of represents the fatty tail as that black line and the red dot as a hydrophilic head group. So a very, very high pH. Um, so yeah, very high pH, very basic. Um, that carboxylic acid group loses its proton and so the molecule becomes negatively charged. And when you have a negatively charged head group, and a fatty end, the head groups actually repel each other a lot and the favorable, the favorable configuration um, for these charged fatty acids actually in the form of a micelle. Um, so you might, heard of, might have heard of things like micellar water, it's very popular on the market now, whatever. Um, yeah, micelles are, oh there we go, I've got a picture um, of, yeah, it's basically soap. Sorry, it's really not as harsh as soap, the ones that they sell as micellar water, but um, <laughs> basically, uh, yeah, these charged head groups are repelling each other a lot so they like to form these very small, tight spheres called micelles. Um, if you have a really, really low pH, then that carboxylic acid group stays protonated and all the molecules are uncharged. And that means there isn't any sort of electrostatic repulsion between them whatsoever. And you can actually pack them together really tightly um, in the form of an oil. So when you buy neat um, oleic acid, actually it comes as an oil. And when you buy other fatty acids, it either comes as an oil or as an oil if you heat it up a little bit. Okay. But there's this like magical Goldilocks zone where if you have some of the molecules charged but some of them uncharged, then these molecules like packing into flat bilayers. And that's when you start making these vesicles um, or lipid bilayers that start resembling uh, what we see as you know, uh, cells on Earth. So this is what they look like under the microscope. It's not like terribly, they don't look like cells there necessarily, but um, I'll just describe what we're seeing. So this is us starting off with oleic acid and then putting it in a buffer into this Goldilocks pH zone where basically a lot of the molecules are protonated but half of them also unprotonated. Okay. Um, we see these vesicles that are very, very high contrast under a base contrast microscope which highlights refractive index differences. And we call these multi-lamellar uh, vesicles. So multi-lamellar means that there are lots and lots of bilayers that are stacked up against each other. And yeah, so we can see them quite easily. Uh, we also make unilamellar vesicles. These are basically almost like ghosts. Um, there's just one uh, single lipid layer encapsulating the liquid interior. This is kind of like what all cells on Earth look like. Um, you have tubular ones, you have spherical ones. It's kind of a zoo. And if you look at the largest ones under a microscope and dye the membrane, so dye the lipid bilayers with, uh, say, this red dye, um, you can see the structures more clearly. And here what we've done is we've uh, dye labeled the RNA and then um, sort of added some oleic acid to it and just shook it up a bit. And you get RNA uh, inside these vesicles. We basically diluted it so you can't see the RNA outside the vesicles. But anyway, you can definitely encapsulate RNA inside these vesicles for hours and it's not going to leak out. And these are long, um, longer chains of RNA. If, however, we labelled just an RNA monomer, you can see them crossing back and forth across the membrane. So being able to see this um, under a microscope is actually super helpful. We can start understanding the biophysical uh, permeability um, <coughs> properties of these membranes. So um, these very sort of onion-like structures, these um, multilamellar vesicles, um, they form quite readily in people's experiments, not just in our lab, but in other labs that have been working on this for decades. And um, people realize that although these don't exactly look like cells that we know of that have very well separated membranes, um, they're actually pretty cool because if you subject them to sort of cycles of, you know, Keeping, the, keeping it wet and hydrated, then drying it out, then like adding water and 
rehydrating everything again, you're creating these uh, very well-ordered sort of spaces in between the membranes in which uh, reactions can happen. So what people found is that as you take a multi-lamellar uh, vesicle system and subject, to wet dry, subject it to wet dry cycles, you can actually get uh, things polymerizing um, because of the tight confinement these uh, molecules are subject to when they dry out. So I think what people did was they might have put in some DNA monomer and then dried out these vesicles so that it basically just looked like soap scum, added water again, dried it out to soap scum. So basically very little sort of technical oversight. But after doing that a bunch of times, they looked at the DNA monomers and found that they'd like joined up into a long chain. So that's pretty cool. Um, another cool thing about these sort of multi-layered, um, multi-lamellar structures is that about 10 years ago, a student in Jack's lab figured out a way to make them grow and divide. So what I've shown up top here is a cartoon of how that happens. So you have this multi-layered uh, membrane structure. And if you add more fatty acid to the system, it starts growing into a filament. So if it becomes easier to see. But if you stare at the bright dot in the middle, it's shrinking in size. And that's because it's growing into this weird, like, filamentous, spidery structure. And the the reason you can see it is because the contents of the vesicle has been dyed to be fluorescent. So you're actually seeing the contents here. And then once it grows into a filament, you can shake it. And then it divides into several, they call it uh, daughter cells. And the contents didn't leak out. So this was super exciting because all of a sudden we had a way of making these fatty acid systems uh, grow and divide. And so then the dream was to put it all together. We have these RNA molecules with this very sophisticated chemistry. You can get the RNA to grow and divide. You can get vesicles, the membrane, to grow and divide. So what happens if you put it all together? So it turns out that you need magnesium in order for RNA to polymerize. And if you add that to membranes, you basically get soap scum. So if you know about, like, or if you've lived anywhere with hard water, you know there could be a lot of like calcium in the water, and so it's called hard. And you can't really use soap because the calcium basically makes the soap precipitate out and aggregate. And that's exactly what was happening to our membranes. They're essentially soap, and magnesium is not that different from calcium, and everything was just precipitating. But Kate Adamala, who was a grad student of Jack's, um, realized that if you could chelate the magnesium with something like citrate, so citric acid is um, a pretty common, well, it's very important in uh, organism metabolism pretty much everywhere. Um, but if you use this like sort of very common molecule, um, it actually binds to magnesium. It still allows the magnesium to catalyze the polymerization of RNA, but it doesn't destroy the membranes. So this was all of a sudden like a eureka moment. Said, so, okay, we're going to continue on with this protocell work and see where we can get. Okay, so this is the dream now. Um, we want uh, we we want this system where we can encapsulate RNA, long bits of RNA that we can then like apply selective pressures to and evolve into something more interesting. Um, and here I've color coded, you know, what we can do well and what still needs more work. So I'll go through each of these bits. Um, so if you have RNA that's bound to its complement, so there's a lot of hydrogen bonding between the nitrogenous bases, um, you can separate the two strands by heating it up. That's good, we know how to do that. Um, if you wanted to initiate a round of copying, you need to stick onto these individual long strands, a short strand called a primer. And this is actually super hard because if you melt apart these two long strands and want something short to bind onto it, the other long strand can come back and outcompete the short strand. So this is actually like a huge outstanding problem in the field right now and um, something that a lot of different groups are working on. Sorry. Um, so after you separate the two long strands from each other, to initiate another round of RNA copying, you need to a primer to anneal. But if the primer has annealed, that only hydrogen bonds with a couple of bases, right? So it's energetically much more favorable for the other long strand to come back and anneal. So how do you stop the other long strand from coming back? That's like one of the outstanding questions. Um, the next uh, sort of part of this cycle is once you've stuck that primer on, the short bit of RNA, and you want to extend it, um, we want to be able to extend it quickly and extend like a lot. But uh, with RNA right now, there are clever chemists in lab working on systems to extend longer bits. Um, but I think at the moment, um, 
to extend maybe by seven bases, we need like a day with RNA. So it's rather slow. Um, yeah, so that's why I've color coded that like kind of red, but kind of green, kind of good, kind of not. Um, yeah, and then with the, with the sort of membrane part of membranes growing and dividing, um, I'm, that's basically what the rest of my talk is going to be about. It's like we have one way of doing it, but is there a more generic and robust mechanism for doing it? So the current growth um, and division scheme for a membrane is to add a sudden excess of lipid so these things grow into filaments. Um, and it only works if the vesicles are these sort of onion-like multi-lamella structures. And so um, I guess the reason I'm in lab is because I said I wanted to figure out a way uh, to, to grow and divide these things in a more generic fashion. So going back to square one, I want to think about what does it mean to grow a vesicle and what does it mean to divide it? Or it doesn't even have to be with fatty acids, it can be with other molecules. So to grow um, a vesicle, um, it needs to sort of grow in surface area and maybe volume, and that means you have to add lipid to it somehow. So that might mean that um, these uh, smaller things have to fuse onto a bigger one or something for it to grow. Okay. And then in order for it to divide without losing volume, you need the structure that it grows into to have a high surface area to volume ratio. And imagine that if you have a turgid sphere and you try to divide it, into two daughter cells, it's going to have to lose a lot of its volume um, in order to make that happen. So growth needs to result in a high surface area to volume ratio for efficient division. Okay. And then to even to get division to happen, you need the membrane to bend, which is energetically maybe costly under certain circumstances. And then you also need the membranes to actually fuse and pinch off. And so all of each of these steps is, I think, in itself a pretty hard and important biophysics question. Um, so I'm just going to try and look at some of them eventually. But for me, the first step is um, I need a model system to work with in, under to in order to understand the biophysics of these membranes. And my aim was to make unilamella, uh, so instead of these like multilamella sort of onion-like structures I've been talking about, just a vesicle with one membrane. Um, my aim is to make unilamella vesicles. So then when I do experiments, it's, it, it's much easier to interpret uh, results across a population instead of looking at something like multilamella vesicles on the right. And the other nice thing about unilamella vesicles is that they resemble what we know as a cell much, much better. So most organisms we know have one or at most two membranes that are well separated from everything else in the cell. Um, any other membrane is compartment in the cell. So here's a picture of some yeast cells. The membrane has been dyed lots of different colors. It's kind of pretty. Um, so I want to make something that looks like that. Okay, so people uh, in synthetic biology have been quite gung-ho about making uh, liposomes, these unilamella uh, phospholipid vesicles for ages. And it's really overwhelming looking at the literature because if you want to like do microfluidics, it's a, it's a whole new skill set. And the way I convinced myself to not do microfluidics is because I tried and it was really hard. Um, also, mo most of these methods are for phospholipids and it's actually a different molecule to a fatty acid. So they didn't translate very well. And um, finally, the, the thing was like, you know, it's not prebiotically plausible to like etch a silicon wafer and cast a PDMS device. Anyway, I basically just like wanted to be really lazy and like not do microfluidics. So don't tell my boss. Um, yeah. So then I decided to think about, well, what is the special thing about the molecules we're using? If trying to translate these microfluidic methods from phospholipid systems into fatty acid systems isn't easy, what is different about the molecule? And it's the thing I told you maybe 20 slides ago. And that is, in order to make these bilayers, the molecules have to be kind of charged, but not too charged. So half of the molecules, more or less, have to be negatively charged. And in fact, if you look at the literature for phospholipid liposomes, most of these phospholipids are neutral. So they're not going to um, have any electrostatic interaction with each other, whereas fatty acid bilayers will. So this is a picture of a cute kid. And basically, we, we know from everyday life that if you have like-charged things, they're going to repel. So then the hope is that by having negatively charged molecules in my bilayer, that the bilayers will repel each other, first of all. And also, if you dig up some old papers, so from 30 years ago, um, you'll find that if you have a negatively charged membrane of any sort, there's actually an electrostatic penalty for bending the membrane. So this isn't just like a cell membrane. It could be like a piece of rub or whatever. 
there's a, it, having electrostatic charges actually helps keep things rigid. Okay, so that's basically what I decided to try. I was like, let the negative charges do their work. So um, on the left here, I show buffer conditions um, that we normally operate in, in lab. So um, just to give you an idea of what that means, um, these sort of, we're working very salty conditions where basically if you want two negative charges to feel each other, they need to be within like a fraction of a nanometer of each other. So the charges don't really matter. So all I did was drop the amount of salt that was in the solution um, that we normally make vesicles in um, just to see if the negative charges can feel each other a bit more. And so on the left here, I'm scrolling through a sample that you make under normal buffer conditions. And on the right, I'm scrolling through a sample where you just add less salt. And basically what you see is kind of maybe the negative charges are doing something, like the membranes are better separated. And actually, if you take a histogram through all of these like big, um, big rings that you see on the right, um, it looks like that most of the large vesicles are actually unilamella, which is pretty cool. And then uh, I kind of was thinking like, we need some salt. I mean, in most origins of life theories, like there is some salt in the system. So is this too little salt to even be relevant? Um, but then of course, like if you, you look at, you can look at many, many papers and they'll give you different answers, but it turns out there are surface pool systems that are as not salty as the system I'm working with. So that's um, promising. Okay, and then the second thought is, um, if we did have a surface pool where you're depositing lipids on the bottom in a, in a cake and then it rains, and then these lipids hydrate and form vesicles, um, these sort of surface pool systems aren't going to be like smooth laboratory glassware, which is what we use in lab. Um, instead, it's gonna have a rough surface. So when I buy oleic acid, put it in a vial, add buffer, and make vesicles, I'm not mimicking prebiotically plausible conditions, like I should put something rough in there. So I decided to put, instead of using just smooth glass, like put glass beads on the bottom of my vial, add some fatty acid, add some buffer. And what you see self-assemble on the right here is again, these very well separated membranes. And this is under high salt conditions. So it turns out you can force these membranes to separate from each other uh, just by using some surface roughness, um, even without dropping the salt. So I think at least for me, it's useful now because I can start doing microscopy studies where I'm making vesicles. I can put dye labeled RNA on the inside, like you can see here in green, and start looking at what's happening. And instead of looking at a system where everything's multilamella and it's hard to compare neighboring vesicles with each other, I can um, sort of more confidently compare these uh, thinner structures. Um, yeah, so the next steps, um, now that I have a model unilamella system, is to start doing the biophysics, so asking the more important questions. Can these membranes bend? Can they fuse with each other? Um, and how robust is this sort of unilamella self-assembly? Like, is it going to be plausible um, if, is it, is it possible if I add a little bit of amino acid? Is it po possible if I add a little bit of RNA? Because if it isn't, again, the system isn't relevant. And then hopefully when I figure that out, it'll get us one step closer to making this protocell in lab that we can evolve, grow into multiple generations, see what the offspring do. It's very exciting. Um, and then again, when we achieve that, uh, all we want to do really is to provide some constraints into understanding like what was the origins of life. Yeah. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you, um, my boss, my funding, and for, uh, to Greg for organizing. Yeah. I was going to bring some in, but I didn't actually go to lab this morning. I just stayed home. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are they stable? Like, can you carry can you bring them around? And yeah. How long do they last? Um, so I think the problem with the fatty acid I've been showing everyone is it's supposed to oxidize in air. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not supposed to keep them around for a month, but I do, and they look the same. So You can always keep things a little bit past the expiration date. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true everywhere. <laughs> Unless you're a serious chemist, then you shouldn't do it. But, yeah. Um, yeah, so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so I would encourage people from the audience that are, uh, you know, either in the class or are, are just joining us for the um, seminar to uh, fire away. I, I do this. I, I think your hand went up first. Hi. 
Uh, are you just wondering if you're controlling oxygen uh, in your models of soil, I guess? And, you know. no. So we do have a glove box in lab, and people have done experiments. Instead of using magnesium, which I showed you, people have used iron too, which oxidizes quite readily. So you have to do it inside a glove box with nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, but I haven't used it. Um, it's mainly the, if my fatty acid is oxidizing, I think there are some pretty clear signatures, like it starts turning brown things like that. So I haven't bothered to use it yet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the uh, competition of the mature strands with the primer problem could be solved by a repetitive RNA sequence with, say, a repetition of about seven. Perhaps it should also be palindromic, uh, so yeah. that it forms a hairpin. And, uh, then you could get shifts that would uh, uh, enable a primer to bind. Uh, yeah, uh, that's pretty cool. I don't think anyone's thought about using repeating sequences, at least in our lab, so mm -hmm. that'd be really cool. Um, people have thought about using secondary structures and also like strand of displacement and toehold exchange, so mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it is, um, there are probably a variety of solutions out there and that would be great because, you know, lots of solutions is good. In your, um, in the uni lamellar vessels that you've been making, can RNA monomers cross the, cross the uh, membranes or not? Yeah, they can. So RNA monomers can. And then um, the, the actual test I was doing with that image there was um, I wanted to see if bigger sort of a polymer of 10 A's or something could escape, and it didn't. Yeah. Can you talk about fluctuating? Um, water levels, concentrations, what about you consider having fluctuations of other variables like, you know, pH or something similar? Yeah. Or temperature. Or temperature. pH and temperature. So yeah, um, Sharif Manzi was uh, in Jack's lab a few years ago and he did a lot of work on temperature, thermostability. So um, trying to understand like what can, what are the limits that these uh, different membranes can tolerate. So he tried a couple of different membrane compositions. And then he also tried like temperature cycling. So there are specific combinations that we work with in lab now because of his work. That, so they're very thermostable and um, they can tolerate, you know, 90 Celsius and then back down to like 10 degrees. Oh, well, maybe not 10. It's recording. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Th 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 there's like very good work there. Um, I haven't personally tried to subject it to temperature fluctuations, um, but I have tried to do pH screen because no one's done that before. Um, yeah, so the chemists in lab are like, oh, you know, if, uh, if something's buffered and it gets concentrated, the pH isn't going to change. <laughs> like, okay, but what if the pH fluctuates for some other reason? So um, the, the self-assembly behavior is sensitive to pH because, of course, you get micelles and neat oil on either end. Um, but there is a pretty broad range in the middle where you get these well-separated structures. So I only realized that last week. I was very worried about it. I thought there was like a magical pH that it happened at, but yeah. Do any of these fatty acids have their like self buffer to the magic regime? Self buffer, yeah. So that the magic regime is their pKa. Oh. Um, yeah, typically the concentration of fatty acids, at least that we work with, is lower than the buffer. I don't know. There are some groups that don't use buffers at all. They just titrate it to the correct pH when they see that they have vesicles. Then they start their experiments. Yeah, I don't know. I have noticed that if you do titrate it, it um, changes over the time, time scale of hours for some reason. Um, so they probably do buffer a bit. Yeah. Okay. If you have RNA inside vesicles and then um, you do a wet dry cycle, does it mess with the RNA inside the vesicles? Or um, so I haven't tried that myself. Um, People have found that even with unreactive RNAs or like unreactive uh, starting molecules, they will polymerize if they're trapped with other ones. So I don't know if that's messing with or like creating something good. Um, yeah. So you're saying like if there is an RNA with a function like. Um, yeah, I guess because RNA are because they, you know, they go bad very easily. So you know, would they survive such wet dry cycles? I mean, just, just a... Yeah, yeah, yeah.
I mean, the, the, they don't break apart, if that's what you mean. Oh, I don't know. I guess the more uh, basic question I have is, uh, if you are, you need to have the polymer, but the source of the polymer, which would be your carbon hydrogen, how, how can you, you know, what in, in your experiments, how can you provide that source of, of elements to form the polymer? What conditions do you, do you have to, to create a polymer? Yeah, so um, I think most of the time in lab when we make these like starting no, actions. Not in the lab, but I'm saying you're talking about oh. the origin of life. Yeah. How would we conceive having those elements be created? Are we be put together? Yeah. Uh, Sucre, do you want to ask that question? Do I have a slide? You have, you have the slide of the origin of the stuff. Yeah, yeah, that was just referencing that paper though, but I don't remember what this is. Yeah. Um, so there are things available in the atmosphere um, that can condense into mineral form, react, catalyze. The so molecules the are. Continuous, continuous source here, we have the concentration to create that, right? So a, a meter we fall in the, in the ocean is not going to be the back concentration. Yeah. Are you asking for the source of fixed carbon compounds specifically? Or something? Well, you need carbon, you need hydrogen, continuously fed something. To be but those are all here. I know. But you need, yeah. to, you need energy, you need to be able to get them together. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, if you're concerned about yeah diluting in the ocean, I think that's why some surface uh, pool theories have become favored recently. Um, okay. Yeah. But as for a continuous source, I think it's it's atmospheric, and then some things are from minerals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when they did the experiment where they had the multi lamellar compartments, and then they added more fatty acid and broke apart, um, did the budded uh, new compartments also have multi layers? Or okay. Yeah. I was wondering if you know, the reactions that happen, you said there could be reactions in between the layers, if what was created then could be butted off into cells with one, one layer. Yeah, so um, I don't quite know what the intermembrane force is. They seem to, there seems to be a, a short range attraction for some reason. Um, so yeah, if there's a gap there, I think that gap would be well preserved and you could propagate that gap to the next generation. So I think it's like a very cool system. It's probably more probable than a uni lamella system, but um, it's just like a, it's just a tool for me to use now. Yeah. So then could you remind what was the effect on the architecture of these physicals in the roughness versus rough versus uh, smooth um, uh, surfaces? Yeah, oh, you're asking what the rough and smooth surfaces were? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I don't have a picture of it. Um, the smooth surfaces are usually a glass vial. Um, and then the rough surface is colloidal silica, so some chromatography beads. Yeah, so five to 10 microns in size um, in the bottom of a glass vial. And how does that affect the, 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 the way the, the vesicles look? I mean, I just m missed that part. Oh, that's OK. Um, yeah. Sorry. A lot of because this is interesting because there is, there is this work by Lee Krumin, which is sort of evolving salad dressing droplets. Yes? Uh -huh. uh, when, when he is basically channeling the different, uh, different fatty acid vesicles, and basically there, there's the surface areas of different, or, or different arrangements of, of the surfaces, of, rough, of surface roughnesses, they are actually acting as a sort of evolutionary channels for certain vesicles. Oh, you know okay. I mean? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just more. Not, it's, it's less of a co less of a question rather than a comment. Yeah, no, no. I'd so, love to read that. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the so what what this rough uh, rough surface does to these vesicles again? Um, it well, the vesicles that self assemble tend to be more spherical, and the vesicles tend to be more unilamella. Yeah. And less multilamella. Yeah. yeah. So what Lichtenstein tries to do is different roughness. You know, also the chemical composition of the roughness rough surface. You know, it also changes the architecture of these vesicles and then also quite interesting stuff actually. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, might have to a, ask you for a link. It's or just a, a comment yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. Question. Cool, cool. Yeah. Any more questions?
Well, with that, let's thank the speaker again.